So welcome to the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons podcast. I'm your co-host, Brian Waterman, a sports and shoulder elbow surgeon at Wake Forest University in association with Atrium Health. I'm fortunate to have Peter Chalmers, a shoulder elbow surgeon at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, as my co-host. Before we get started, I should mention that the views expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of the ASES, the University of Utah, Wake Forest University, or any of the institutions of our guests. With that formality out of the way, it gives me great pleasure to welcome two great guests today that really need no introduction. They are players within the ASES as well as the community at large. Dr. Ben Ma is our first guest, and he hails from the University of California, San Francisco, where he's been recently appointed as chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and as professor in residence of sports medicine and shoulder surgery. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Our second guest, not to be outdone, is O.K. Anaquenze. He's the head of shoulder surgery and professor in orthopedic surgery at Duke University. O.K., welcome to you as well. Thank you so much, Brian. Glad to be here. Thank you. Well, you know, the, the, the pleasure of doing these podcasts is that we really get to dive in on topics that I think deserve probably greater area focus. And there, there's a much needed discussion we need to have about the topic of business and business management in orthopedic surgery. Increasingly, we're seeing the influence of financial pressures and certainly a lot of business decisions on our actual clinical practice of medicine. One of 20 uh, orthopedic physician executives is a shoulder elbow surgeon. One in five is a sports surgeon. So we've definitely seen an uptick in the way that we interface with administrators and our departments and offices. Uh, As surgeons, uh, Ben, what what is the impetus for pursuing outside business management opportunities? Yeah, I think it's really about learning the lingual and also understanding what the drivers are in terms of you know how to make decisions. Uh, because as physicians, we always focus you know, about how to deliver the you know, best clinical care. But the business aspect, you know, we actually don't really pay too much attention to. Um, so having the right knowledge and also understanding what the link or what it actually you know focusing on is very helpful when you actually get a seat at the table. Yeah. Okay, for you, what 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 drives you towards pursuing those opportunities? Just for reference, you know, the you you did an MBA, an executive MBA, four years into practice. What 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 was the uh, the goal behind that? Oh yeah, thanks. You know, I think it's uh, you know it's 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 it, as these things go, it's usually personal. You know, it's always a sacrifice to go back to school and you know accumulate those loans and and the uh, the pressures of studying again and all that stuff. Um, for me, it was um, at that time it was a realization that I wanted to be I need I not even wanted I needed to be a better leader. Um, you know, I had my own practice and then and, and I was always interested in business. You know, I thought about going to get an MBA while I was in medical school, but I couldn't verbalize why at that time. Uh, when I came out into practice, I realized that I had to be a better manager of people um, and also a better sort of strategic thinker. Um, and finally, I wanted to be connected to the entrepreneurship aspect of healthcare. And I felt like I was more of an ideas person creative, but not understanding, you know, what is value, what are the levers and things like that. So I wanted to be a better leader. I wanted to improve my network. I wanted to be a better manager Um, and to look, you know, and I think it's helped really in, uh, for me anyway, personally in, um, in ways beyond business, you know, even in research and things like that. Yeah, and I love both of your responses. I think they help to pick up on a couple common themes that we'll probably continue to flush out in the course of this next, you know, 25 or 30 minutes or so. Maybe if we can, for those that are less sophisticated with all the options available, let's kind of lay out the menu of 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 business opportunities that you can pursue. We all know that there's a kind of a traditional MBA track and and many individuals do that within the confines of business. But then we've certainly seen a surge in these executive MBA programs, those that are more specialized executive MBA programs, such as those that focus on healthcare. 
you've got a master's of health administration, you've got a number of certificate programs or kind of a la carte educational offerings, such as those provided through Kellogg School or Wharton or any number of these other great um, schools. Maybe stick, okay, uh, let's stick with you. What are the merits and relative benefits of, of these for the budding physician executive, those individuals that want to deepen their pockets in some of these areas you just mentioned? Well, you know, when, when I was a, a medical student, you know, I went to Mayo and I had a lot of good mentors. And one thing they always said was, you know, especially academics, academics, academic medicine is about three facets, you know, clinical care, research, and education. So those were the three facets I really spent my entire sort of residency and fellowship focusing on, you know, surgery, teaching, research. Um, times, times have changed. And over time, I sort of feel like now, in my opinion, at least, there are five facets. It's those three, but includes leadership and business. You know, healthcare is um, in a bit of a crisis when it comes to finances. Most hospitals are in the red. Um, we're trying to transition out of the hospital system to ASCs, uh, insurance issues, what, what, what have you. Um, it's a field that will always be in service, but I think it's a time for more efficiency. So I think that, you know, if you're in private practice or a hospital, administ like a hospital based system, I think that. It affords you, if you want to stay in healthcare, it affords you the ability to sort of understand the levers that create potentially a successful clinical enterprise, understanding the middle managers, the people at the top, um, you know, the simple, the, a lot of the things are simple from an MBA standpoint, but I think that it affords you to get a deeper understanding, to communicate more clearly, to um, propose strategies based on practical um, solutions as opposed to potentially, you know, the sometimes in academics, it's strategies are not really based on practical finance. Um, so that's what I think. I think it gives you opportunities. It gives you uh, a larger network and allows you to think about things more strategically and practically. And Ben, you've taken somewhat of a different path. You've um, certainly achieved incredible heights now as chair and and uh, have had many leadership positions maybe speak to where you've cultivated these these skill sets and and what of these options have you utilized in the past to benefit yeah great thanks brian and i think certainly mentorship is extremely important um, i'm fortunate to have great mentors over my career uh, to guide me through some of these um learnings. Uh, Freddie Fu is one of them that really kind of guided me early on in my career. And also like, within the UCSF, they have you know, faculty that actually I look up to and really kind of help me through the process. So that's probably like how you learn on the job. Um, I've done some of these shorter series, uh, for example, the AOA Kellogg series, which used to be very popular maybe about 15 years ago. Um, those are smaller commitments. Usually you go there for like a you know long, longer weekend, like you know Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, there are multiple modules you could go through to kind of learn about how to manage conflicts, how to manage your negotiation, kind of skills that you learn. Um, and that kind of helped me to kind of just understand a little bit about what my uh, strengths and weaknesses are. So you know, as a leader, I think most important to understand what your style and personality is. Then you can actually more effectively kind of work with others over there. Um, and I think that kind of helped me um, with that process. Um, and I was, you know, kind of... Um, Tell every member or every you know, person that listens to the podcast, if you haven't done one of those personality tests, do one right away and uh, be sure about read about the comments about what you know kind of a, a person you are because um, it, it's probably pretty accurate to describe you know, who you are and you may be surprised uh, with some of the findings because I did mine and actually didn't pay attention to it. It was actually my wife that kind of found that report in, my, in the trunk of my car like you know, half a year later and read the report and said, this is exactly you. Why I was saying that, oh, this is nothing. This is just, you know, you know, like trash over here for the course I went to. But she said, this is exactly you. You know, kind of read, you know, carefully and listen to what is being suggested. So those are really kind of very revealing, you know, activities to help you understand yourself more to be a better leader. Yeah. You know, I, I just want to say, you know, um, which may come up, you know, so one, I 100% I, I agree with the um, personality assessment. You know, we did that, you know, it was the first thing we did before we started. The second we got, you know, accepted 
you know, and the different types, as we know, you know, we did a Berkman, which was like a 300 question thing. And it's, it's, it's amazing how accurate this stuff is and how, how impactful it can be, you know, to understand your own triggers, how you may trigger other people, how you may come across, how other people might perceive you. Um, so I found that to be incredibly helpful. And also, you know, being in business, one thing that was helpful for me is they're all at your level, you know, especially in an executive MBA level, they're all CEOs and they have their own company. So they're going to call you out. And, and I felt like I needed that, you know, it, you know, we have a, like, it's called a mini board, six months with the same group, working projects. And you have these interactions, these charge interactions, and everyone's in different fields. And, you know, it was incredibly helpful for me to know how I might be getting perceived by other people um, in a way that wasn't getting communicated to me eloquently in healthcare. Um, and finally, you know, like mentorship is so important and uh, Ben is right. And, you know, you definitely don't need an MBA. You know, Ben knows probably everything I know. Um, you have to just have the ability and find a way to get that knowledge. I think you definitely need the knowledge. I don't know that it's only from an MBA, but you have to find a way to get this knowledge is my opinion. And both of you have certainly um, enjoyed the opportunity to learn from incredible and very masterful leaders. You know, Ben, you mentioned Freddie Fu, which is the expert tactician of the nth degree and, and uh, just what a fantastic way that he cultivated the pit system from the ground up. And then okay, you with with Bill Levine, you know, just very masterful with people, with interacting, with conveying dignity. And I I would submit to you that, you know, nobody is self-made and that a lot of these skill sets fall inherent to us, um, can be cultivated through some of these personal inventories. You know, those are decidedly honest appraisals of you. And so, you know, what is maybe something you've learned some some from some of the 360 evals? Uh, that you've done either past or present and how has that guided your leadership style? Well, I think that in the past, um, you know, like for example, I give very direct feedback. I'm very direct, but I don't like getting direct feedback. You know, like, <laughs> I don't like, you know, you know, but that's, you know, part of that is thinking, you know, you know, I, 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 I give things that I, I, I can't take. Um, you know, meeting people where they are, you know, I, I, I was very, very rigid, you know, like my Berkman, you know, it, it, these bar graphs, the, the range of person that like mine were very narrow all across the board, like extremely narrow. Um, and that's someone who doesn't compromise very well, someone who definitely thinks his way is the right way, someone who is not afraid to give you criticism, but doesn't like to get criticized, criticized. Um, and there are many more, um, examples. Um, and, you know, the truth of the matter is some of these things, good mentors like Bill Levine already were sort of, you know, working with, working through with me. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you have to take responsibility for your own life and, you know, fly, you know, spread your wings as they say. Um, but those are some examples. Um, and those are things that I, to this day, I, I work on and I think about when I interact with people just to not fall into those traps. Hey, Brian, I would add also one that, you know, very common personality for surgeons, which is very common with my analysis, so it's a quick to judge. Um, so when I get my personality evaluations, are always very, very, you know, you know, I'm quick to judge, very, very perceptive. Um, you know, again, doesn't listen very well, right? Um, and I kind of learned my lesson early on, you know, when I was kind of in a leadership role, how I lead my group, uh, because every time when there's a problem, when there's an issue, I already made my, made up my mind. So, you know, kind of my mind's made, and when members tell me things, I just kind of, you know, don't really listen as much. Uh, and after kind of you know, going through that process, learning about some of the personalities I have, and also listening to my wife telling me that how accurate those are over there, uh, that I tend to listen more right now. So, you know, at meetings right now, I tend to be the last person to get, you know, um, my opinion, uh, kind of listening what other, other people's, people's thoughts are. Even though I may have an opinion in mind, 
uh, I actually want to make make myself listen, and hopefully actually have a better you know kind of a conclusion at the end. I think those are things that you know how these、um, training could you know make you as you know, make you a better leader. Just recognizing what your personality traits are. And work with it, you know, because we're not going to change it. We're not going to change who who we are, surgeon. We're not going to change it. We actually, you know, can you know give criticism, but can't take it very well because we are certain people to be good at our field. But you know, understanding some of those differences、uh, will make you, you know, probably more effective moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that keys in on some really key concepts.、Um, you know, the interpersonal management.、Uh, you know, how you empower leadership and lead from the front, as well as peer-to-peer -peer leadership.、Um, kind of some of the distributorship model.、Um, maybe can we talk, Ben, a little bit more about what is the added value in an academic setting? I think many of us, myself, okay, yourself,、uh, are in academic institutions, and sometimes. Feel a sense of powerlessness in guiding the business strategy and the operational side of of a very large health system. One of my colleagues says it's like steering an aircraft carrier.、Uh, talk about how this may add a business curriculum of some variety may have value in the academic setting. Yeah, I think you kind of you know.、Um... Bring up some of the main issue, right? Now, as an academic institution, a lot of times we kind of don't react as quickly, and also don't make you know decision、um, as effectively as other you know、uh, entities.、Uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. You know, bad means you make decisions slow, you kind of miss the boat. Sometimes good means that you don't not rational about you know, not very you know kind of a、uh, quick to make decisions,、uh, make the wrong decisions over there.、Uh, but as an academician,、um, that's even more important. Uh, to actually learn some some of these skills and then be have the business in acumen because、um, there's not a lot of people actually you know in those roles in academic you know medicine、um, you know various you know when you go into a、um, private organ a private organization or more like you know、uh, a business you know oriented group are there are more people interested in those areas so you know for academic department it's even more important to actually have you know people with a skill set to help guide the group. Go in the right direction,、uh, and as most of us know too, as healthcare has changed a bit over the years,、uh, and most academic institution even has you know very very business you know、um, uh, focus. I have CEOs actually have different you know interests、uh, and different you know, kind of vision you know for the program.、Um, so we need to be the voice for the academician to kind of really preserve our identity. Not just be another you know big hospital system that do a lot of surgeries or deliver clinical care. But why are we here、uh, as people that actually want to focus on research, or education for the new generation? Because if not, our voice would be lost. I think it's it's going to be extremely important the way you do that. Yeah. And okay, you, you've you've got a, a background in private practice.、Um, You know, I, I think there there is incredible value there、um, for a business acumen, and I think with the growing presence of private equity, when you talk about consolidation of practice groups, is a is a business background even more relevant now in the contemporary practice environment? Oh, hundred percent. I think a, I think I think a business background is helpful in any environment.、Um, the mission will be different in. Different environments, but there will be certain things that will cut across. You know, obviously, private equity is a big thing now.、Um, you know, an MBA, at least the training or business training in general,、uh, may allow me to look at that, look at that、um, a certain way. The anxiety is a lot less. I fully understand. I read and studied. You know, what private equity is looking for. Um, understand how they value things. Understand, you know, what kind of multiples they're looking for. You know, what's the year typical, you know, exit time frame they're looking at.、Um, what do they consider a good opportunity versus a bad opportunity?、Um, you know, and normally these are more private practice things. You know, well, you know, I want to build a surgery center and we want to maximize revenue and throughput. But the academic center centers. Are changing. They have to. It's becoming more competitive. You can't just say I'm Duke, so you know everyone's going to come. You have to understand the markets,、um, how to get into different markets,、um, what's a profitable market versus not. The mission is always on patience. 
Um, but you also have to understand how to keep your enterprise profitable and successful. And even in things like the mission being research, you know, which is why I left private practice comes to academics was because I cared more about the academics than I did about the business of medicine. You know, I care more about research and teaching and complex surgeries than just making money. But even if it's convincing people to do the right research or to mentor or to volunteer times in the underserved community, whatever it is, you know, these things take a bit of, bit of organizational behavior training. You know, how do you frame your arguments? You know, how do you meet people where they are? You know, what is a convert communicator? How do you get the right people on your side? Um, and doing it in an honest way. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, in academics, I think it's very useful. I think it will become more useful as we go forward. Um, I think the leaders should have business sort of training so that we don't have a lot of other administrators sort of coming in and sort of telling us, how we should run our own practices. Um, so I think it can be valuable in any, in any setting. Yeah, and I, I want to pick up on a couple things that you alluded to. Um, and, and I really want to kind of dive in on, on how involved you are on a granular level within your departments and organizations as it relates to some of these things. You know, Ben, San Francisco is a very competitive market. And there's a lot of forces, uh, both academic, private, hospital-owned in your area. Um, how involved are you in discussions on growth, strategy, outreach? I think we're all accustomed to a grassroots uh, campaign with individual websites and everything. But tying this in with a broader strategy uh, and interfacing with your marketing folks and your CC individuals, uh, maybe walk us through what that looks like for you at UCSF and, and how you uh, are gainfully involved in that conversation. Yeah, thank you. Now, I would say that we are very involved. Um, and um, it started with my previous chair, uh, Ted Vail, that actually came from Duke uh, to join us uh, 16 years ago. Um, Ted came and one of the thing that kind of separated us as a department is that we actually were able to you know, uh, build a um, surgery center uh, and we call it like the Orthopedic Institute, which actually we, where we have clinic and all our capacity. And what it does actually give us some financial um, independence uh, from the rest of the health system. It means that there's some, you know, um, gain sharing that comes through the departments that allow us to be successful and able to kind of support some of our academic mission. And throughout that, you know, uh, that um, a joint venture with the you know hospital, we're able to kind of really creatively kind of look at where we actually strategically build growth across the Bay Area. Uh, that's something I was you know kind of helping him uh, when I was in a different role as a vice chair for adult operation in terms of where the you know where the opportunities are for growth. Um, so we as a um, as a specialty has been you know, working with the health system closely in terms of where the where the opportunities are uh, and what the direction is. So as chair right now, I think that's eminently involved because, you know, as orthopedic surgeon, we are kind of the the darlings of health system, right? You know, we bring a lot of business into the system, use a lot of resources. And most of the time, our patients are, you know, very uh, well, you know, paying patients uh, that the hospital likes. Um, so I think that, you know, we are at the table most of the time in terms of discuss about where the opportunities are where the resources we need to kind of move to. Um, you know, since being a chair right now, there are a lot of discussion even about where the resources should be allocated. I think that's one thing that's different with my role now is that when there's, you know, you know money need to be invested, when do we actually get another proton beam therapy, you know, a unit which costs millions and millions of dollars, but that potentially will drive business to the hospital will help the cancer surgeon, help the orthopedic cancer surgeon, and maybe, you know, kind of you know, raise the prestige even more, more to bring, you know, more patients to the health system. So so those are decisions that you're involved in. Um, so I think that um, those are opportunities that, you know, if you have the right lingo, understand the, um, the finances well and opportunities, then you can actually be part of the group to make decisions, you know, to kind of, you know, change the direction moving forward, yeah. Yeah, maybe stick with this for a minute. Uh, in your role as vice chair of operations, did you help to design or inform those policies? Were those already kind of pre-existing 
walk me through what it looks like to initiate some of those fairly bold interventions in in you know a UC system, which is is tough. Yeah, we are pretty slow moving as a as a system. You know, part of a you know a University of California health system. Uh, but when when my when I was in the chair of vice um, chair of adult operation, one of the things that um, we did was you know there may be some concept or idea that the health system want to do or from the department and as vice chair for me is really about executing uh, what are the opportunities that we can make it you know work um, one of the things we actually made a decision during COVID is actually move some of our um, inpatient elective surgeries away from the main hospital uh, the reason why is because the main hospital is pretty congested um, and because of COVID, we were able to kind of reopen one of the hospitals. Uh, and we as a department took advantage of it as well. We will move, uh, but when we move, we actually want particular resources to help us. Uh, and for me, it's really about, you know, creating the right opportunity to allow the department to be successful. So that was a pretty, you know, kind of a, um, a big decision, you know, for the health system to make that, you know, choice um, during COVID. But we actually benefit quite a bit as a department because we become more efficient. We actually move to a hospital that we actually have, you know, control of most of the uh, the OR and, and also the um, hospital resources. And what it does actually open up resources in the main hospital, allow other services to go also. So it helps both sides. Um, so I would say that, you know, um, you know, you know, I would actually tell people to listen to is this, even though that you may be a, a staff, you know, physician or faculty members, or maybe some leadership role, you are involved in every part of it. You know, because when decisions are made, how to make it work, everybody needs to be part of that solution. Um, so don't, you know, just step back and say, let people run it for you because you are actually part of the solution and also like, you know, decision making also we have. Sage like words of wisdom. Okay. What what about you? How, how have you been involved in dictating policy there at Duke? I know you guys have recently been undergoing a transition to several ASCs and have you been able to influence that policy? And if not, Maybe we could talk a little bit about, you know, vendor contracts and, and um, um, you know, individual uh, preferences versus trying to contain costs and, and trying to keep this, the, the shelves relatively limited in, on, on stock. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, it's a great question. And, you know, obviously, you know, my role at Duke is certainly less important than men's role at UCSF. So I'm not going to sit here and sort of um, try to, Follow him, but I'd say that one thing Ben said that needs to be said, and something that I probably should have known when I came out, but I didn't. That everyone is a leader. You know, when I came out, I sort of thought, well, a leader is the person with a title, and this is why. You know, when I came out, I was like, oh, well, you know, everyone needs to lead. Um, you know, within do, you know, my role coming in was to sort of try to help build the shoulder program, which was already very, very strong with a lot of great surgeons, Brian Garagoose and Higgins, et cetera, of the past, but just to try to help galvanize it, put it together. Um, and, you know, even in that setting, I think the business background really helped out in terms of um, creating long-term vision. You know, what is our long-term vision? That was five years ago. You know, let's build our academic portfolio Let's, you know, try to start having some joint conferences. These are little things, but these things build culture. And culture is so important. They say in the business, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, which is which is true. Before you think of the strategy, think about culture. Um, so that's getting people on the same team. Then, you know, we've had this big integration. Um, cost containment is now a thing. We've, you know, negotiated our shoulder contracts. With the vendors, we've gone to a bit of a three vendor system. Same, similar thing, potential UCSF uh, profit sharing um, saving program. We've been able to save over a million dollars in the last year alone. You know, the profit, the, you know, and we get a, a piece of that, not for personal, but for academic endeavors, research, education, things like that. But being able to negotiate that, just, you know, part it's simple stuff, but just understanding. You know, and this is entrepreneurship. You know, if you're talking to Tournier, you know, what matters to Tournier? You know, having a sense of the cost of goods, having a sense of their margin, understanding, you know, their volume within the system and how that influences how we negotiate with them. Um, you know, part of the healthcare system's goal now is to, you know, to increase the footprint of orthopedics. 
so that we compete more effectively against you, Brian. <laughs> um, you know, but with that said, you know, it's, um, you know, we have to identify areas, footprints that we think we can add more volume. Uh, we just hired a new shoulder surgeon. Um, you know, he actually a current fellow uh, in Utah. And, you know, part of my job for him is to put him in a position where he can be successful and have a practice. So he wins, Duke wins. Um, but part of that is just understanding some of this, the business, simple business things, work with other people, though, who help out. Um, and then, you know, ASC transition, you know, um, you know, I was the CEO of an ASC in California, an outpatient joint placement center um, for a while. And, you know, that was part of the reason why I got the MBA was to learn how to do that better. Um, but it, it's allowed me to at least voice some opinions based upon some sort of data about how I think we should consider transitioning, you know, with shoulder arthroplasty, what kind of companies do we look for in the ASC center? Um, even as we build new ASCs, you know, little things, you know, like understanding that Medicare, you know, they need a certain number of cases done before you get approved. And, you know, by the time you're, you finish your market, your, your, your contracting for the ASC, you have to think about your marketing and before you even open, you have to already have, a certain number of patients sort of on board, things like that. Um, so, you know, my role at Duke has been, honestly, it's been more, it's been very much on the shoulder side, um, growing more generally, um, not nearly as robust as Ben's role at UCSF. But, you know, for whatever is worth, you know, I think it's been very helpful to, you know, and most importantly by far is to help me build a culture um, that we can grow from you know i think that's the most important thing was building a culture i think building a good culture is not as easy as it sounds yeah okay i would come comment that uh, don't belittle what you're doing over there and there's no job is small and no, no job is too big over there and for the audience that are listening to is it's really about getting involved and i think that if you kind of shut yourself say oh this is business this is finance i don't need to be involved in it then you're really missing opportunities. I think you know you have to be at, at the table, listening to what people are saying, uh, figure out what are you know the things that you could you know, help to improve on. Because um, we are the one that's really kind of taking care of the patients. We you know we are the one that can make decision on what's going to help us, uh, but we actually not there making decisions. Someone's going to make the decision for you, and most of the time it may not be the best. Um, so having you know a, a seat at the table, we're able to kind of contribute. Uh, that's very very important. Yeah. Ben, what, what are additional resources that you lean on today to guide your business decisions? You've obviously got a great background, but uh, I'm wondering, is that, um, is that, you know, books, is that interactions with other people, is that the Harvard Business Journal? Talk me through how you're, you're making some of these informed decisions in your current capacity. Yeah, I'm still learning on a job. So, you know, maybe in a, you know, in a few years, I could give you an even better answer, but I think, you know, um, we are sometimes so focused on healthcare alone because we are physicians where we're good at what we do and that's what we focus on. Um, having friends or colleagues or, or other folks actually in different sectors and, and kind of talking with them about what the stresses are, what the drivers are, would be very, very helpful. Um, being in, Bay, in the Bay Area, um, I have a lot of colleagues or patients actually in the a different sector, for example, the tech area uh, or the venture capital area, and just even like uh, interacting with them, understanding what are they thinking about healthcare, what are they think about their area, will help you guide you uh, in terms of you know a better business decision. Because sometimes we actually put up you know blinders on, all we focus about hospital growth, patient growth, but sometimes it's not about growth; it's about what patients need um, and understanding you know what. You know, the people, the lay public, you know, what their needs are, what they are looking for, uh, you know, in terms of healthcare, will kind of guide you a bit. Uh, so my suggestions is really about broadening your scope, um, not just focus on your own area, but really listen to what, you know, what the other people are, you know, doing or thinking that will be really helpful with it, yeah. Yeah, and you're talking about creating value, which I think is important as we consider this, you know, loading the trucks, certainly making sure we're good stewards of quality is key. 
Um, okay, wh what what additional resources might you recommend? And and if I could maybe put an additional spin on it, what's the role of an executive coach for ongoing development in your leadership uh, journey? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think an executive coach can be extremely helpful. Um, we have the wrong attitude when it comes to some of these things. We will say, well, an executive coach means that I have a problem. An executive coach can really help with strategy. They can help with relationships with colleagues. They can help. And a lot and a lot of these executive coaches in healthcare, some of them have been in healthcare leadership. So they know the issue that you might be facing. You know, I've had an executive healthcare coach. Uh, which was extremely helpful and one that I sought out myself. Um, critically, I mean, just having someone who understands to talk through some of these things with, because ultimately as a leader, you're making decisions that affect other people's lives, not their, their lives, the children's lives, their spouse's lives, their, their parents. And you want to try to make the best decision you can, and you can't be too proud to ask for help. Um, now, on a personal level, you know, I, I listen, maybe a little less these days, but, you know, I listen, I listen to a lot of leadership podcasts, read a lot of leadership books. Um, I try to keep my mind open um, to other things, technology, technology that can help healthcare, you know, um, informatics. Um, but I think of all those things, yeah, for me, I, I try to, I gravitate towards some leadership podcasts here and there, um, but not not focused on healthcare specifically, just in general. Yeah, both of you alluded to that, you know, gleaning lessons learned from other areas, tech, you know, business, um, the corporate world. I think there's a lot to be gained from that. Maybe as we continue to wrap this up, Ben, uh, in your day number, what, of, of chairmanship where are we at with day probably 90 something right now so yeah all right so so double digits what's the biggest challenge you face from a business perspective and and how do you work within your department to to address this um good question over there from a business standpoint i think that the biggest challenge is to understand the scope of the department right now, um, and I think that um, it sounds silly. Oh, you know, you meet with your finance, you know, officer, and you know, kind of figure out what the you know books are. Um, but you know, the scope is not just the salary, the compensation, you know, what the revenues, but you know, things like pay and makes, things like you know how you you know allocate your resources. Um, for example, resources in the clinic resources in terms of how much help in each individual, you know, get those are actually, um, you know, different business entities over there you need to kind of pay attention to. So little things like that, how do you really get a handle of balancing out, um, you know, what's the right balance for each practice to allow them to be successful? Uh, that's something I'm still learning about uh, over there. Um, same thing with the operating room. When do we open another room? When do we just staff another, you know, a while to go later? Or open, you know, on a different day. Um, those are the business decisions we have to kind of figure out, and uh, in each area have different um, way of calculating it. And just because someone has really, really good about, you know, calculating these you know, resources, it may not be, you know, applicable to how you use it at your center. Uh, so some of these decisions you have to kind of, you know, take it with a, you know, some, you know, a grain of salt and just understanding what the needs are and build on them. So I think that's probably the biggest challenge I've learned right now from that, uh, from the business standpoint. Uh, but, you know, but it's exciting. I think there's a new, uh, hopefully, skill or tools actually may acquire. Uh, but, you know, that's something that's constantly we have to kind of get better at. Yeah. Well, it's good to know that I have you on speed dial so I can uh, lean on your expertise. This is great. Uh, certainly a wealth of knowledge. Okay, any parting words of wisdom that you have to our listeners? Uh, no, I think, you know, um, I'm honored to be here. I think for whomever, especially the younger generation, I think that healthcare is changing. Um, I think you have to focus on yourself as well, keeping your mind healthy. 
burnout is a real thing. I think learning and having a mindset of learning and growth, however that is in business, whatever, can only help you in ways you may or may not know. Um, and I think most importantly, understand that everyone is everyone is a leader. And I think you owe it to yourself to try to be the best leader you can be. You don't have to go to school for that. But I think at least thinking about it, finding good mentors like Ben and others uh, can be greatly important. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Appreciate uh, the time here with you guys. And I put a plug in for, you know, a great leadership think tank in the Fagan Leadership Forum. Um, you know, I, okay, I, you're, you're, you're involved in that. And uh, I've certainly benefited incredibly from that and lessons from Coach K and Fortune 500 companies. So definitely a quick plug for that. Uh, we had uh, Dean Taylor on uh, a few weeks ago and that episode will be forthcoming but he he alluded to the the importance of that and and edifying his career. So, just another kind of common theme that I think we see come up time and again. Yeah, it's a great program. Yeah, I heard great things about it. And again, it's about having the right connection, connecting people, and to learn from each other. I think that's you know important over there because sometimes people from a different sector would listen to what your problems are and say, "Oh, wow." You could treat it like this, you know, and they actually almost like, you know, kind of open up, you know, something that, oh, my, why didn't I think about that over there? Um, so having the right colleagues and actually others would be a good sounding board for you uh, as a leader is important because sometimes you get so, you know, kind of honed in into your decision making, you forget about there may be the other ways to do it and other other folks may be able to see it much more clear than you are, yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, truly fantastic words of wisdom. And, and I'm so honored to have both of you as friends and colleagues. And I really look forward to the great things you have on the horizon. Thank you. That's about all, Thank the, Thank that's you, about all the time we have for the podcast today. Uh, thanks so much to you both for all our shoulder and elbow listeners out there. Don't for, forget to subscribe. And for Peter Chalmers, I'm Brian Waterman. We'll see you next time.